Welcome to Artists in the World, an Apollo and Charles Russell Speechley's Art Law Briefing video. I'm Thomas Marks, hosting on behalf of Apollo magazine, and in this short film we'll be discussing how artists might best navigate the complex interaction between the cultural and commercial obligations that are often put on them. We'll be thinking about pitfalls for them in terms of their legal obligations and pr the protections that are available to them. And one question we really want to ask is how artists can get good independent advice on how they think about their careers and their work legally and strategically. Before we begin the discussion, a message from Apollo's partner, Charles Russell Speechleys, from partners and art law specialists, Tim Maxwell and Rudy Capildeo. I'm Tim Maxwell and this is Rudy Capildeo, head of the art and luxury team at Charles Russell Speechleys. We're delighted to partner with Apollo on a three video series of talks encompassing museum governance, digital marketplace, and artists in the world. Charles Russell Speechleys is an international law firm with offices in the UK, France, uh, Switzerland, Luxembourg, the Middle East, and Hong Kong. Um, our art and luxury team is top tier. We love looking after our collectors, creators, and curators um, to protect the assets and objects that they love. We hope you enjoy the video. Our speakers bring perspectives from first-hand experience of working as a leading artist, of advising artists, and of providing legal guidance to them. Michael Craig Martin has for five decades been an internationally acclaimed and hugely influential artist from his work in making radical conceptual statements or interventions, from his painting, his sculpture, and as a teacher for many years at Goldsmiths College. And most recently he has erected a magnificent monumental magenta fountain pen at the University of Oxford. It was quite a alliterative fountain pen, my, Michael. Um, Rebecca Davies is a founding partner of Southern and Partners, an independent artist management consultancy working with artists in their estates. And she has 20 years of experience working in senior positions at major commercial galleries and as chief executive of Lepada. Tim Maxwell is a partner at Charles Russell Speechleys and a recognized leader in the field of art law, including art litigation and disputes relating to luxury assets. I, I'm going to start by sort of uh, perhaps fulfilling my question as I ask it and ask you, Michael, just thinking about, I mean, in your years teaching at, at Goldsmiths, even back to your own training, the sense that artists at art school have had of you know, how they might start to build their careers and, and what they might need to know, even from a legal standpoint, but even perhaps just from a strategic standpoint. Just from, a, from an ordinary practical uh, standpoint, but what, what, how on earth you were going to survive, I don't remember ever discussing it when I was a student. I don't think it was a subject that was ever, uh, ever brought up. I mean, I, th I think, uh, so, uh, I, when I was teaching, uh, particularly in the 80s and the 90s, uh, I, teaching at Goldsmiths was a very, it was a very interesting school because it, it had attempted as a school to approach the world that the student was going into as a known, that they were not going into some vague, mythic uh, being, wonder of being an artist but of something that they were going to have to, if they were going to survive, they were going to have to deal with it. And so there was an attempt to make it, the, the course, in a sense, a realistic but, but a protected environment in, when, in which a student could learn to succeed or fail to try things out, but with a view that that, that was something that they could then take into the unguarded or unsafe world of the art world where there are there, where there are dangers and but there's also opportunities and it, you need to be you need to have some kind of sense of when there's a true opportunity i mean i, I saw with my own students that there were times when they were very young and they were offered opportunities that were amazing and i and they were often advised not to take them because they were too young 
And my view was always, if the door opens, it's best to walk through it because it may never open again. You have, there, are, there are moments, and you have to rise to the occasion. And I think one of the things about being an artist is learning to rise to the occasion, to take the opportunity, to take the risk when it's there, and learning how to do that. So, and so I'm, in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that it's more important to me that a, a person who's in art school learns how to manage themselves in relation to what they're doing than in relation to the world that's awaiting them. If they know how to handle themselves, if they know how to deal with, with the kind of situations internally that they're going to uh, confront, then, they're, then they are prepared. But do, do you think that people coming out of art school now and indeed the world around art and artists and the wider world come out of art school thinking of themselves more as that, that they're professional artists. Is the word professional sort of more important or the sense of it? I, I, have to, I have to warn you that I have not been teaching for 20 years and I'm not going to be able to provide you with very <laughs> up-to-date information. But, my, but there's no doubt that the art world has changed out of recognition in the last 20 or 30 years. When I, when I was a student, um, I considered art and uh, what one called the art world uh, was I discovered this fantastic secret that nobody knew about. And it was just a wonder. I just couldn't believe my luck that I'd stumbled on the best thing in the world and hardly anybody knew about it or cared. Whereas th that is certainly no longer the case. There's far more, you're probably in the public eye more quickly, you're maybe being talked about on social media, collectors circling the schools. I can't, I can't imagine uh, sort of in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, artists sitting in the offices of a law firm talking about, uh, about the role of artists. You're absolutely <laughs> right. I'm, I'm embarrassed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, moving on to think, I mean, I, I want to come back to to the sort of people that artists might take up as mentors. But to, to come back to you, Tim, um, I mean, that sense that artists, uh, Michael puts it really nicely in terms of are prepared for the things or with, are, are comfortable in themselves for the type of things they might face. But, but what are broadly some of the pitfalls legally that artists might face early in their careers? Yeah, so I think you've identified some of them, um, obviously. Um, sort of exploitation early in the career with collectors circling, um, say, art schools, things like that. Um, also, um, just being careful what you agree to. Some artists we come across are incredibly commercial, incredibly switched on, and have a very good idea of what they're happy to agree to, what they're not. Um, others look to you as a sort of independent guide um, who they can trust because you don't have any interest in it apart from advising them um, in sort of recommending a complete way forward, whether that's con contract with a gallery. And then some people unfortunately come to us because they've got a problem. So there's fakes or forgeries in their market, or um, they're being, they feel they're being exploited by a brand, say, who's taken their artwork. So there's sort of a variety of things um, which have to be thought about. But um, I think the pitfalls can be different for each artist. It'll depend on the medium. You know, some artists are easier to fake than others, um, that sort of thing. Re Rebecca, um, you are working with both some very established artists mm -hmm. and some emerging artists as well. Um, I mean, for the emerging artists, what what type of thing are you advising them on? Yeah, I mean, our in in our business, I mean, our our clients are more established artists, but we are working with some emerging artists on a mentorship basis mm -hmm. um, because emerging artists don't, you know, have the ability to sort of, you know, fund a team of advisors. But it's important to us that we're able to share the knowledge and help these people as they grow in their career. And I think it's things as basic as a consignment agreement. You know, they say, oh, do I need to have one? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And it's, you know, things like that, understanding, you know, giving them the real basics of how the commercial relationship works. Because if you've just come out of art school, you won't know, you know, how much does the gallery take? What, what costs do they cover? What costs do I cover? Those are the kinds of things that are sort of market knowledge that should be shared and out there. How and much they, work should I make? How much work should I make? How, how much, much work should I to sell and who's consign to them? The Do I consign them everything? Do I only consign one edition, wait for that to sell and move on? And who handles production costs and how are those repaid? These are the things that I think if 
young artists coming into the market understand and have those tools, it makes it much easier for them to make their decisions and to avoid some of the pitfalls that then they end up at a lawyer and you know having problems. I, uh, plenty of artists of, of my generation who, who are, are friends of mine, we talk about what their gallery situation is and you know whether they might be taking, taken on by another gallery. You see, I almost said whether they might take on another gallery and the question of whether it's the artist taking on the gallery or the gallery taking on the artist. I mean, are, are you, yeah, Michael, you suggest, you said, well, you know, if a door is open, go for it. But, but does that apply to when you're starting to navigate the world of galleries and representation? Well, I think it's a, it's a very, very difficult world to navigate because there are implications in everything you do as an artist which, have, which can have an impact further down the line. If you, if you, take a, if you go in one kind of direction, um, you come to be identified being in that direction. And if you decide later on that you've made an error in, of judgment in that case, it's not easy to pull back from that because you've all, you've, there's a niche you're in. And it, that, can be, that can be very difficult. I mean, I, I was going to say that in, um, in my experience, the, uh, the most difficult situation that I've known over the years many artists find themselves in is having consigned work to a gallery. The gallery sells the work and doesn't pay the artist. That is the most dangerous thing for an artist. There's very little that the artist can do in that situation. And, and, and the, it, the next level I suppose, is that the, that the gallery says, well, we'll pay you once you can sign the next bundle of work to us. Exactly. So and, always so, want so you, and so you, you, and, and you're thinking, this, these people already owe me money, mm -hmm. and the only way they're offering me to get paid is to give them, put more of my work at risk where I may never see it, and I may, because the work maybe, if, if the gallery sells the work, you don't see it, you don't, the gallery is not under an obligation to tell you where it's gone. And the, the person who bought it, they bought it in good faith, they're not to blame in this situation. But the gallery may be struggling financially, uh, and very often what you find in galleries is that there are some artists making money and some artists who are not, and the gallery funds itself from the artists that are making the money. So the, the artist so as the supplier. That's what I meant about the artist being vulnerable yeah. in this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, it, it's an age-old problem in the art world. And I think that, you know, most galleries will, you know, try and do the right thing, and there are contracts, and there are all these things. But that's the sort of nature of the beast. And, I mean, we were working with a company that's introducing a new product to the art market, which is effectively looking at that and trying to instill some transparency and being a trusted third party so that when funds come in for any sale, they come into a third party account and the artist and the gallery are both notified and then paid out. And it gives the artist that reassurance that as soon as the money is received, they get paid. And as soon as the gallery gets their money, everybody's square. And I think that that's something that we need to be looking towards because you know everybody looks at the art market as opaque. And generally speaking, I think, most galleries are doing the right thing, but then sometimes bad things happen and everybody gets tarred with the same brush. So to be able to have these sort of uh, platforms to help create transparency is really important. I mean, if a gallery like that goes into liquidation, puff, there, there goes you know, your, yeah. your, your payment for your work. I mean, what, how would you advise a, an artist to, to, in a situation, not, not if the gallery is going into liquidation or administration, but the, that the, is basically being paid on the credit from their previous series yeah. of Yeah, I mean, well, it sounds very boring, but um, having the right documents in place obviously helps um, quite a bit. So obviously the consignment agreements, you can maybe pull them out um, if something does happen and it's put into some sort of insolvency protection. Um, and there are arguments that can be made. And I think probably as lawyers, we probably see the the dark end of the art market. So we see more than our fair share of where things have gone wrong. So it gives you a slightly skewed view that the um, art market you know, is frequently not providing the service that artists would expect, but um, we don't see the good side of it. And I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, Tim, because one of the th things that, that that throws up is you talk about 
the documents, the consignment documents. But we've got a, an ever wealthier or, or more sort of money flushed art world. We've got documents moving around here and there, but we still have this sort of patina of the art world that it relies on, on trust and handshakes and you don't actually want to pull the rug out from your gallery who is supposed to be representing you. It's a bit of a double bind. Um, it is, and I think a lot of deals still are done on trust and there's sort of this mystique of the art world. This is just the way it's done. I mean, even when people buy art, you'll have people who say property tycoon to, if they bought a building for that, would have this whole table would be covered in paper. But on an, in the art world, they accept that They'll just shake hands and that's the deal. And, and sometimes we're talking about things that have a price which is comparable to property. Yeah, absolutely. But it's just the way, it's part of the magic, I suppose, the art world, that it convinces people who in normal circumstances wouldn't do something But like I think that. it's really important then that artists have that agency to be able to speak up for themselves and to say, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to consign works without paper. I'm not going to, you know, because these are the things, you know, if, if, a, if a gallery or a dealer is going to pressure an artist to do something without the correct framework around it, then you don't want to be working with them. I mean, there's yeah. a reason, you know, why if something doesn't feel right, it's not right. There's, there is, there's a problem in this for, for young artists, mm -hmm. which is um, there's an awful lot of them. And it's very competitive and they're very hungry for something. And I do know of uh, galleries who have repeatedly, uh, frankly, cheated the artists. And yet, so they, a, 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 a generation of artists leave and another generation of artists arrives and eventually they arrive at a very similar position. And so that it's very, uh, one can say this is what one should do. Of course, yeah. But of course, if you really are desperate. But then equally, if they're given the tools to understand what it should look like, then at least they have that ability uh, you know, to a, a lawyer, have that conversation. A lawyer, I dare say it is, is an expensive recourse for an emerging artist. Mm. And, and there is a sense in which you know, perhaps we can come back to other ways in which artists can, can seek guidance. But I want to just come back to something else you said, Michael, which is this feeling of, OK, you can sign the work and, and you don't know where it's going. And I wonder whether you feel like that sort of changed for artists at all, whether maybe sometimes for artists at a certain point in their careers, a certain stature, they might s start to say, think, I don't really want all of my work to disappear to X collection or this collection. I want to have more of it in public collections because I feel like it has a kind of public facing insistence to it. Yeah, I, I mean, I uh, certainly have work that uh, is for sale, but we would, I would only sell it in very special circumstances, and it, which would probably be a museum, a public collection, or maybe a handful of important collectors. If it was going into an important collection, I might, might consider that. But uh, and I, but I'm in a position to be able to do that. I'm with a gallery where that's not a problem, and I can and I can do that. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure that everybody. I mean. When you're at a certain stage, you really want to get out there, really, and that is very, very important. The, the, the luxury of being able to choose where your works go is a luxury, and some people get into that position where they can, uh, they can decide which, which, who, who can get the work, who can have the work, and that can be done by the artist in conjunction with the gallery. It can, it can be the artist who insists on this. And, but then, but at that point, you can see that the artist is in a very—that's an artist in a very powerful yeah. position. You have, you can, you don't have that option unless you're in a powerful position. Because, because I, I, I know artists for whom they're just slightly wary. They they have very good relationships with their galleries, but but when an entire body of work is disappearing to private collections, I mean, it, it is in this specific case I'm thinking of. It's it's private collections in China. And, and absolutely, great, great, their work is there. But actually their concern is, is, will I be able to get this work back for exhibition if I'm called upon to, to put this in a, in a public exhibition, in a museum exhibition? Do I have any recourse at that point? Are you seeing more contracts, Tim, that are trying to have clauses in them that, that say, well, this is what the future 
opportunities to have access to my work are. Yeah, I think people do try to control that, but it's a limit, it has a limited effect. Um, so, I mean, for example, the example you choose of China, um, it would be very difficult to force someone in China to provide the work back um, for display in the UK. So it's it sort would of be very difficult to, do, to force somebody in Britain to... Yeah, yeah. true. If somebody owns something, they can choose to lend it or, or not. I mean, I, I, in my own immediate experience, one of the great limitations today on this happening anyway is uh, the cost of doing it. Your, your scotch is way quite a lot, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> you, you raise something else, which is um, that sense of... Uh, the cost of producing things for museums as well. Um, and I suppose you know, when, you, when a museum approaches you to, to do an exhibition, is that something that I suppose your gallery might handle with you talking about really the, the sort of um, the vision of the exhibition and, and what is possible on, on the budget? Uh, for other artists, for emerging artists particularly, their first museum show, say a second museum show, that's a tricky discussion. They might end up out of pocket in making something which is going to be of great benefit to their career, probably. Yes. I mean, I've, I, I must admit, I've tried always never to put myself in a position where I was going to be out of pocket with, with something like that. But um, again, the, uh, the question of, of, of where you are within the pecking order of things about what your, what your, your clout is, and of course, to have something happen in a museum for an artist is a wonderful uh, opportunity, which artists, of course, want to take. And uh, I mean, for myself, I, I've always I'm a control freak about a lot of this business, and so I like to be to be having the final decision on virtually everything to do with that with, with the situation. Although I'm incredibly grateful for the the background handling that the gallery and 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 sometimes it's it's very useful to have the gallery be fronting you because because they have a position they have a power too which is very useful I, I want to come to Rebecca on this because some galleries do have a lot of clouts particularly mm. in the contemporary world yeah. in terms of I wouldn't say buying museum shows, but being able to, uh, shall we say, ease the path uh, to, to yeah. The I mean, I think. I mean, I, I would. I would really hesitate to say that galleries buy museum shows. I think that there are definitely galleries that put more effort and have a larger team and more network within museums. And then museums. Listen, we know all museums are struggling on budgets, and if they know. There's a big gallery behind an artist that can maybe help contribute to the transport costs and you know some of the other things th that they may look more favorably upon that. That said, I think you know hopefully most museums are curatorially speaking working independently. And I think for artists, the thing to think about is you know we've we've seen it in the past with artists that we've worked with that the contracts didn't protect, let's say, an artist's fee for a site-specific installation or something like that. And then all of a sudden, the budget goes and the contingency, the artist fee goes. And they say, but we were meant what well, wasn't in the contract. And it's making sure that from the legal side, things are completely correct and concise. Because like we say, these gentlemen's agreements, you know, the museum will look for the easy way to make those things up. And usually, it's the artist that is the short end of that stick. I, I was going to say, though, before I almost slandered various blue chip galleries who <laughs> say we had bought uh, exhibitions, but the, the mid level galleries and, mm. and artists that are in galleries that perhaps haven't got that heft in terms of the network, if, yeah. not the, if, not, if not the financial heft, sometimes they might have connections with one or two museums. And I just wonder whether for you you feel that a lot of the artists you're working with, or some of them at least, are requesting different kinds of conversations with, with museums and with the, the not-for-profit yeah. sector. I mean, that's, you know, that's a big part of what we do because blue chip galleries through to you know, smaller enterprises, they, can't, they just don't have the bandwidth to be able to have that broader network. And they have so many artists on their books to be able to talk about everyone to every museum is not possible. And so it's about being strategic. It's about thinking very carefully about what fits and how you propose something, present something, 
And you know, for, for us, that's where we come in, and we're doing that in support and alongside the galleries, not in sort of any competition with them. So, yeah. To, to shift the dial one more time, I just want to talk about, um, Michael, you, you, you described yourself in, in exhibition making a, a, as a control freak, but is that also the case with when it comes to intellectual property? Um, is that something that you've had to sort of learn for yourself in terms of relationship of your work, what you're doing, copyright, moral rights, and so on? I, I, I'm, I'm very insistent about um, copyright. And I have, uh, I have problems of um, kind of crude fakery. It's not. It's, you couldn't call it forgery. Imitation. Imitation. That yes, you know. Even even if you Google my name, there's a lot of things that come up under my name which I didn't do. Tim, just to come back to this intellectual property point, um, is that something? I mean, you find that that flares up into things that people are actually consulting you about? Or is it often something that can be just resolved by people realizing they've had their copyright infringed and uh, take down notice and so on? Well, it can often be resolved quite quickly, but it often requires a lawyer to be involved for it to be taken seriously. I think a lot of, um, say, brands and things would turn around and ignore the artist. I mean, it may be, I mean, there have been examples where social media has had a huge impact on those brands um, and they've then changed their position and realized that you know their position was toxic um, but quite often we get involved because it's very important to the artists so for example if their market's being flooded with fakes and it's very hard for those fakes to be dis distinguished from the real thing that is a time when the artist will come to us and say can you solve this problem um, and often you can um, but i think it does require an intervention um, quite often um, in order for people to take it seriously. Michael, independent advice for artists, where if, if it's not at a, a legal level, or if they don't think it quite is, where, where can they turn? Who would you, where would you build up your mentorships and so on? I, I suppose my instinct is to say other artists. As artists, there's a kind of sense of comradeship and dialogue, which, and so, I, uh, I think in, in some ways the best advice, I mean, I, I think the idea of, of, of a consultancy where you, where artists get advice, this is more and more important in the change that's happened in, in the art world, obviously. This was probably less necessary in the old, much, it happened less, it was necess less necessary. Today, I would think maybe that's a, that's a, a very good idea. I mean. The, the only thing that I would say is that um, uh, I think one has to be careful not to have, uh, if one becomes too involved in these questions, that can have an impact on what you do too much. And so you need to slightly protect yourself from becoming too legally engaged. And, and so it's Probably better to have somebody else like you guys to do it. <laughs> well, on that note, we've had uh, we've had artists on a pedestal. We've had artists falling between the cracks. We've had the uh, aspiranto spoken by artists to each other, um, and we've had. Uh, I, well, I'm glad, in fact, uh, we've had artists disappearing. But I'm glad we've had an artist on, on this uh, video. So let me say thank you very much to Michael Craig Martin, to Rebecca Davies, and to Tim Maxwell. And thank you for watching this Art Law Briefing, which has been brought to you by Apollo Magazine and Charles Russell Speechleys. <laughs>